It's the Friday before Christmas in San Francisco. The mistletoe was hung with giggling anticipation over the glory holes. <laughs> the stockings were hung on the penises of the strippers who were making their own white Christmas backstage. The festive lights included a Klieg light, its rotating beam shining from the gutter, literally, looping across the filthy facade of the campus all-male theater. Yes, it was beginning to look a lot like Christmas <laughs> and smell a lot like poppers. After weeks of planning and this giddy few hours of us setting up this party, our party that we named, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. Oh, sorry, I'm Dreaming of a White Necklace. <laughs> Important distinction. The party was happening. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly, baby, exactly. Oh my God, hold on, yeah, oh my God, hold on to that, hold on to that. Yeah. The place was packed. I was standing in the middle of the makeshift dance floor at the campus all-male theater, dressed as a slutty elf cigarette girl, <laughs> handing out free Jägermeister shots and free rum shots from my little tray that was attached to my chest. People were just so damn happy to be here. Everybody was dressed in their sexy, sexy holiday best. They wanted a shot or just to say hi, or to have a little fondle of my jingle balls. <laughs> then, sweet baby Jesus in the manger, in a heartbeat, my fun stopped. Across the dance floor, I saw her, a tall woman in a ratty trench coat, leaning forward like into a stiff wind with narrowed eyes and her hair raked back into an angry bun. Julie. She was coming straight for me. She cut a path through all those prancers and dancers and vixens. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Like, like they weren't even there. A hot knife through all that silly queer butter. Julie was like that. She was smart and mean and litigious and homeless. <laughs> she, was my, she was my social work client in my day job out in the real world. She was famous across the city for trying to get people fired. And here she was at the biggest, craziest, sexiest, sluttiest, not quite legal party my friends and I had ever thrown. I was a social worker in a program for people who had frequent visits. Yeah, give it up for the social workers. <laughs> we worked for people who had frequent visits to the emergency room at San Francisco General Hospital. My clients had multiple serious problems. Schizophrenia, homelessness, HIV, cirrhosis from drinking, heroin addiction, some of them were in and out of jail. All of them know, knew the true meaning of trauma. And I loved my job. Seeing people's stamina in the face of all the layers and levels and years of shit they'd been through, by the time they got to me, these people had every right to give up on life. But here they were, showing up in my crappy office in a trailer outside of the emergency room of the hospital, looking to me to see if I had any help for them to help them make their life a little better. Every client was different, every day was different. I had to stay on my toes. I had to be careful and kind and smart and ready for clients to say and do pretty much anything. They needed what I could help with, housing, cancer treatment, needle exchange, talk therapy. But if I came across as judgmental or too uptight or too healthcare-ish, you know what that's like, they would leave. They ha these people had the most highly attuned bullshit detectors ever because they had to. That's how they survived to this point when I met them. Should not have printed two-sided. 
Uh, well, uh, environmentalist, sue me. Uh, and, and my colleagues in that program, so amazing. Righteous, clever, hilarious, scrappy. We helped each other's clients. We supported each other. There were tears. We went out to happy hour drinks. So many happy hour drinks. <laughs> One rainy day, my boss came into my office in this trailer and handed me an overstuffed file folder. It was papers were sticking out all over like angry origami, like lettuce, like pa paper flying everywhere. She said, this client will be a challenge. Let me know what you need. I said, thank you and took the folder, took all the paper. It was that long ago, paper folders. And I, and I was curious, but I was also freaked out because my boss never, never labeled any client as a challenge. Our program was where the buck stopped. We took people that every other social service program in San Francisco had fired. People who, you know, violence, fire starters, we, we took every, we took anybody. And so for her to name somebody a challenge really, really set me aback, really caught my attention. All the papers in this file were complaints and investigations into other social workers and into other social work agencies. Julie's type letters accuse a series of people and agencies with failure to assign proper staff and priority and said that her assigned social workers were poorly trained and unprofessional. Each complaint generated a series of formal responses and updates on investigations into her complaints, resulting into this nightmare of letterhead in my hands. You ready, Joe? Okay. The San Francisco Department of Public Health, San Francisco Hospital Complaints Office, the City Attorney's Office, the State Medical Agency, the Mayor's Office, the Homeless Advocacy Organization. <laughs> Vint vintage logos, those are like old school. It was clear that my name was gonna be all over the next batch of letterhead. Even if I never did anything wrong, the big bosses at the hospital and at the whole county would soon be talking about me in drab conference rooms and in drab memos. The day after I first saw Julie's file of scorched earth, she was there at the trailer to meet me. She looked younger than her age in the middle 50s. She was dignified and imperious. She stood very, very straight with a long jutting neck, like an autocratic ballet school teacher. Are you old enough? You're not old enough for this. That's, a, that's, that's, Debbie, that's Debbie Allen. Thank you, thank you. That's Debbie Allen in fame. You want fame? Well, fame costs. And right here is where, where you start paying in sweat. That's, that's that character. Never mind. So that, back to the story, back to the story. Think of, think of her when you think of Julie. She was beautiful, even though it was easy to see struggle on her face and the ragged edges of her tidy clothes. She was fabulous and terrifying. I felt shabby and dumb in my plaid shirt and my khaki pants. I introduced myself. I shook her cool, dry hand and took her through the narrow hallway to one of the cramped appointment rooms. Down the very narrow hallway, she talked about two social workers I was going to help her punish. <laughs> she stopped short, glaring at my colleague as he rounded the corner and flattened himself against the wall to let us pass. She clicked her tongue. What a sad office this is. Is this up to code? You are part of the hospital, aren't you? In the room, she evaluated me like a horse at auction. She leaned forward and started barking orders. First, she needed to submit my letter of complaint against James Lacey and his agency at South of Market, and then call the city attorney's office for an update on the person before him. I said we should first focus on what she wanted to do for herself, like check her position on the different housing wait lists or make a medical appointment. She read back as if scalded. You were just like all the other ones. You don't know your job. None of you take your work seriously. She stood so fast and so powerfully in that small room that I scooted my, my chair back reflectively. She grabbed the doorknob ready to storm out. Then she turned to me and asked when her next appointment was and could I give her a reminder card. Fabulous. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Queen behavior. <laughs> Debbie, Debbie Allen in fame. I was genuinely, I was like literally, legitimately, genuinely flattered that she was gonna give me another chance to be insulted by her. <laughs> 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 
Soon after our first meeting, it was Christmas, and here I was helping throw the party in the all-nude strip club porn palace. I threw parties about once a month back then with a few friends, but this was the biggest and most exciting one yet. That's me on the left with the green pantyhose over my face. We, th we, we threw cheap queer parties for cheap queer people in surprising locations, usually bar crawls to straight bars that didn't know we were coming. It, it was lots of fun, it got elaborate. It was about as far from my serious work at the hospital as you could get. These parties meant a lot to me. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, population 8,000, where pretty much everything I was doing from this party, from my outfit to this host space, to the flyer I wrote calling the Knights Drag Queens the Ejaculate Conception Players. <laughs> All these things would have gotten me physically injured or worse. To be free to put mistletoe, over glory holes, for, de for the delight of the gay party world of San Francisco, was all, I ne was all I never knew I always wanted. So as the theater got crowded, I started serving shots on the dance floor. It was nice and dark, and our celebrity DJ, John Cameron Mitchell, Hedwig herself, I'm, see I'm telling you guys, that these, these parties were like a big deal. It was a big deal. Was, Hedwig was playing fun music. I was getting kisses for shots. Not something I asked for, but sure. And that's when I saw Julie. <laughs> plowing right towards me. She was focused on the bottles of Jägermeister and rum on my cigarette girl bar. The bar was a thrift store briefcase, spray painted silver and opened and held to my chest with shoulder straps. It was covered with lights and plastic pine garland and Santa art. All that arts and crafts was paying off. She hadn't looked up from the bar to notice my face yet. So I had to get off the floor now. I grabbed my bottles tight. I tried to turn around, but the crowd was too dense. I rammed a dancing woman with my bar and apologized. I wiggled around some more, and now I had my back to Julie. But now that I was facing the other way, the other half of the crowd saw me and my free booze. As it turns out, it's really hard to get across a crowded dance floor of partiers when you're dressed like a Christmas billboard with a lit up tray of free shots strapped to your chest. <laughs> I know, surprising, surprising I know. Like, a friend yelled over all the people, where are you going? I couldn't answer, I couldn't say, shut up, I'm running from somebody. <laughs> I really couldn't say, I'm avoiding a client from work because of a long list of ethical issues that include serving your social work clients alcohol and preserving client confidentiality and negative therapeutic transference and countertransference and because I don't want to have to explain all of this plus the whole not quite legal party to the county health commission and get fired under a cloud of gay hedonist shame that this exact moment at our fucking triumph of a party had me feeling like I could finally put behind me. <laughs> So those are, those are all the things I couldn't say. <laughs> I heard Julie's voice over my shoulder, clear and precise. Excuse me, I would like a drink. I tried to push further toward the edge of the dance floor to the doors that led downstairs, desperate to hide among the glory holes with her mistletoe. <laughs> there was a hand on my later hosen strap and her voice again. I need a drink. I was caught. I turned around. She saw my face and her eyes got big. She paused, I froze, she stared, I stopped breathing. <laughs> I was at her mercy, what was I going to do? Causing a scene was her favorite hobby. <laughs> I, I imagined her taking out a little notebook to make lists of everything I was doing and wearing. Instead, she smiled, serene, friendly even. She said, hello, Hunter. May I have a drink of what you have there? Saying no was the safe thing to do, the correct thing to do, even if it set her off yelling and embarrassing us both. Social workers do not give their clients alcohol. But I decided, fuck it. <laughs> she's, a, she's a person at the party too. Slowly, I poured a careful, half a shot of Jaeger, just 
50% of a terrible ethical lapse. <laughs> I handed it to her with a little elfin bow and said, Merry Christmas, Julie. She smiled and drank it. Somebody behind me grabbed my ass. We looked at each other for a moment. She, a smart, suffering woman, taking a little break from fighting for herself against all the cruelty in her life. Most of it very real, some of it just perceived. And me, her social worker, being as ridiculous as possible with this crowd of happy freaks. Back at the hospital on Monday morning, the elf drag was gone. I was in my social work calculated casual attire. Julie was on time for our appointment. As she hustled me along the narrow hallway, she proclaimed with a sweeping gesture, the people here do try, but these offices are just a disgrace. Neither of us ever mentioned the party. We worked together for three more months before she fired me. Hunter Gatewood, ladies and gentlemen, Hunter.